Today I'll be reading from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name is John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. Isaiah foretells the good news in chapter 61. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release the darkness for the prisoners, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Once we have made the preparations and know that the wait is almost over, there is room for joy as we anticipate what is to come. As we awaken into to Advent, we can let our joy bloom with the knowledge that Jesus is living and active and about to do a new thing in our lives. We light once again two purple candles, representing hope and preparation. Today, we light the pink candle that calls us to joy. Lord Jesus, we anticipate the dawning of a new work you are doing in our lives. Fill us with joy in the new life you bring. Amen. So this morning we are in the third Sunday of Advent, getting uh, each day closer and closer to Christmas when we celebrate Jesus as uh, the light of the world, the one who has come to be our Savior. And I want to start just by sharing a few statistics here. Uh, according to a LifeWay research study, more than 9 in 10 Americans celebrate Christmas. And I thought that was a pretty high number, more than 9 in 10 celebrate Christmas. How much they celebrate the real meaning of Christmas, I'm not sure, but it, it does say that more than 7 in 10 say that Jesus was born in a manger, or born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. And so, um, you know, 9 in 10 celebrate Christmas, 7 in 10 believe historically that Jesus was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. I know that number continues to drop as you ask questions like, was Jesus pre-existent before he was born? Uh, and we're, we'll be looking at that today. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But it won't be a long, it won't be long, in just a matter of days, and we will transition from this season of Advent when we're preparing our hearts for Jesus to come, and when we celebrate at Christmas, the birth of Jesus. And as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, we always mention Mary and Joseph, and the angels and the shepherds, and the wise men, and the star, and um, all of that, and that's all great, and we read about that in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. But as we turn to John chapter 1, it's interesting, because it's just as much the Christmas story and significance, but it doesn't have any of those characters or any of those names. And as we turn to John chapter 1, what we do find is that the meaning and the power of the Christmas story is there, and even in more detail, what we see is the explanation of the significance that God entered our world as a Savior born to us. Genesis 1 is all about God creating the physical world. We know how the very first words of the Bible go, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And John 1 picks up on that theme, but rather than talking about physical creation, we start to discover the one who has come to bring spiritual recreation. And John 1, 1 to 4, notice the similarity in language. John 1, 1 begins, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So whereas Genesis 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, 
the Gospel writer John says, in the beginning was the Word. In other words, Jesus was present uh, at the very beginning at creation. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 3 of John 1, it says, Through him, through Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And so as we focus on the meaning and the significance of the Christmas story, we're talking about the creator of heaven and earth, if you can imagine this. The creator of heaven and earth, the word becoming flesh, enters into our world. The creator enters into the creation. The great author of life writes a new chapter as he enters into the story with skin on, with flesh on, to heal and save the world. The light entered the darkness. You know, I have a pastor friend, and we went to the Buffalo Bills game uh, on Monday, and I'll talk a little bit about that a little later, but he said something that really resonated with me. He said, you know, in a world of such heaviness, you know, we, we walk along or we walk through so many situations, I'm sure many of you can relate, just to the heaviness of the world, the heaviness of the things that you're carrying in your families, with those around you, whether it's uh, physical <coughs> illness or whether it's a relationship conflict or confusing situations, we just deal with heaviness. And he said, we were at the Bills game next to each other. He said, isn't it great just to leave behind the heaviness of the world for a while and just do something so mindless and crazy as stand in you know, freezing cold temperatures and watch as people carry a pigskin like, down the lines of the field. But in this world, we face such heaviness, loss and loneliness, conflict and anger, mental health struggles, financial and work pressure, and so forth. And every once in a while, I just have to stop and say and pray, Jesus, thank you that you have not left us in this dark world without hope. But you have come. You have entered into the mess and the darkness that we experience, and you have come to bring the light of your hope, the light of salvation, the light of eternity. You have come to heal, you have come to save, and one day you will come again. And there's days I just have to stop and say, Lord, thank you that we are not hopeless, for you have come, and the light shines in the darkness. Last week at Linda Keith's funeral, I was talking to one of her grandsons after the service, and um, we were just uh, chit-chatting after, her, and it was a great conversation, and, and I was just able to share with him, well, the, the only reason I can stand behind that podium and have anything to say is because of Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection. Apart from him, this is a very dark world, and every day we're one day closer to our deaths. But with Jesus, we are one day closer to everlasting life and meeting Jesus face to face. And in a very dark and broken and heavy world, I thank God for the hope that we have in Jesus, that the light has come to shine in the darkness. I want us to think about what it means this morning that through Jesus we have both light and life. Because in the Gospel of John chapter 1, these two are uh, very <coughs> intricately connected. Light goes with life. And so through him, that's what we have, light and life. And for just a moment, before we turn to John 1 again, I want to turn to the very end of John's Gospel, where John lays out crystal clearly what the whole purpose of the book is, the whole purpose of the Gospel. So the very end, we've read the first few verses of the Gospel of John. Now the very last verses in John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31, we read the following. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The whole Gospel of John, and, and really the whole focus of the Bible, is about these things. These things are recorded so that we might see the light of what Jesus has done, and that through believing in him, we may have life in his name. Now, when we read life, what is that talking about? Physical life? We all have life. I'm alive. You're alive. People around us, they're alive. If you have a heartbeat, you're alive. But we're talking about a special life. We're talking about a spiritual life, where our, where our hearts and our lives are, are awakened and, and fully cognizant of who Jesus is, the source of everlasting life. You can have physical life, but you have spiritual life where you know you have the heartbeat of Jesus beating in your heart. You have the love of Jesus flowing through your life. You have the grace of Jesus setting you free. You have the mercy of God releasing you from the weight of guilt and sin. There's a difference between having physical life and spiritual life. And what John's talking about is that by believing in Jesus, you may have life in his name. And that's not just physical life. 
That spiritual life. It's new life in Christ. It's everlasting life through him. The entire message of the Bible, from the very first page to the last, and the entire mission of Jesus is about this good news. It's about God's plan to rescue people out of the death and darkness of sin and into the light and the life of Jesus. So light and life go together. When we have life, we have light, and, and uh, vice versa. When we believe in Jesus and have life in his name, our lives are filled with the light of Christ. And there's a lot we can say about what it means to have the light. This morning's sermon t title is about the sun about to rise and the sun shining into our lives. And I want to talk about three types of light briefly this morning. The light of truth, the light of grace, the light of eternity. These are all promises that we want to receive and internalize and live with every day. The light of truth, the light of grace, the light of eternity. So first, the light of truth. When the light shines, when the light of Jesus shines in our lives and we have life through him, through his word, he guides us according to his truth. There is a mind that is dark and not walking in according to God, accordance to God's ways, and there is the light in the mind filled with God's truth that is walking in lockstep with the will of God and with the truth that God has revealed to us. A light bulb goes on in our minds and we begin to think differently. Apart from Christ, we can be in the darkness of our thinking, unaware of the hope of Jesus, living in this dark world without any sense of that hope I talked about, that, that God, our creator, has come to rescue us. Many live devoid of the light of truth in their minds. When a person walks in darkness, they live unaware of this truth and this light of Jesus. And Paul writes about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, where he writes this, The God of this age, little g God, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so if we're believers in Christ, hopefully we're filling our minds so that the glory of Jesus, the shining out of who Jesus is, is filling our minds. But if we're unbelievers, we're blinded to that and our minds are dark. We don't have that awareness of hope, that awareness of good news filling our minds. You know, unfortunately, rather than filling our minds with the, the truth of Christ and his word, so many, millions, young and old, are discipled by the YouTube videos they watch and the internet pages that they go to and other sources. And they turn to these videos and these internet sources as, as their authority. I wonder, what are you putting into your mind and what do you recognize as the authority for truth and reality? Because we can fill our minds with all kinds of things, but not all things are of equal weight, of equal worth, of equal authority. And in the scriptures, we find the light that is our authority. And that's even what Paul says in 2 Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired. That means God, God inspired the writers. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God is equipped and built up and ready and prepared for every good work. What do you look to and receive into your mind and heart as truth and as authority? Because all authorities are not created equal. And many pollute their minds with junk, the junk food ideas of this world, and they wonder, why am I so downtrodden? Why am I so discouraged? Why am I so angry? Why am I so devoid of joy? And the question is, what are you putting into your mind and into your heart and into your soul? But when we feast on Scripture and the light of God's Word, we take on a very different disposition, and we submit ourselves to the highest authority, the authority of God and His will and his work. You see, you can find a lot of teaching. You can find a lot of good teaching on the internet. Don't get me wrong. You can also find a lot of garbage that will pollute your mind and bring you down. I think about the proverb from chapter 16, verse 25. It goes like this. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. And I think that characterizes much of our culture today. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. And I wonder, what are we looking to in our own lives, day by day, as a source of authority, as a source of truth? Jesus wants our minds filled with the light of his truth. He wants to awaken us, that he created us to love us. 
He created us to be in a life-giving relationship with him, that we might find peace and joy in our relationships with others. This is what God wants to wake us up to. And yet we have our minds so filled with so much noise that we can't make space for the most basic and precious of truths, that we are loved by God and our lives are held in his hands. And he's not finished with us yet. But are we paying attention? When we have life in Jesus, we have the light, the light of truth. Second, when we have life through Christ, we have the second light, which is the light of grace. Uh, this is probably a good time for me to think about that Buffalo Bills game. So it was about, I don't know, 33 degrees, and we were out there for four or five hours. And uh, the longer you're in the cold, this is like a really profound statement, don't get this. The longer you subject yourself to the cold, the colder you get. I just want to tell you that. So we were eating our sub sandwiches. We parked on Allen Street. I thought that was pretty cool and a nice coincidence. But we parked on Allen Street, and we had my uh, niece's husband that I went with. We brought subs, and so we were eating subs outside, standing outside in the cold for about an hour. And we got colder and colder and colder. And finally, before it was time to walk to the stadium, we were like a few blocks away. We got in the car, and I blasted the heat. And you know what? Something really profound. The longer you're in the heat, the warmer you get. <laughs> and I think about our world, and our world can be so cold and so hardened and so callous. And if you're just in the world and you just subject yourself without really focusing on what's affecting you and what's influencing you, it's almost like you walk through this world and there's little people. This is a ter this is not a note, so take it for what it's worth. But it's almost like you, you have little people stabbing you with icicles wherever you go. And that can, like over time, if you can catch my drift, that's what it's like in this world. If we don't pay attention to what's influencing me, what's shaping my heart, what's filling my mind, what's influencing me, it's like we walk through the cold with people stabbing us with little icicles. And what does that do to our hearts over time? It makes us colder, it makes us more bitter, it makes us more numb, it makes us more joyless. But you subject yourself to the warmth, and you come into an awesome place like this with God's people, where you're we're being filled with the wonderful news of God's grace and love, and it's like you're, you're in that heater. See, one of the things that I had that I made sure I had plenty of at that game were those hand warmers. I was ripping those things open and shoving them in my gloves and shoving them all over my body. And see, when you have an external heat source, all of a sudden you're not just subjected to the cold, but you can warm up, and I was actually comfortable comfortable for the entire game because I had that external heat source that was warming me up. And the question for us in our lives is what is influencing us? If we just subject ourselves to any source of teaching, any source of influence on the internet, any source of people and company that's not good for us, that tears us down, it's like walking through a cold world with people stabbing us with ice picks, little picks at a time. But when we come before the Lord and we say, Jesus, I want to walk in your ways. I want to surround myself with people who love you, with people who can encourage me, with people who can remind me that you are a good God that has my best interests at heart. It's like we're in the warmth of that heater. We've got those little hand warmers all over, and that is shaping us rather than this cold, dark, sin-filled sin world that will eat us for lunch if we aren't focusing on that external source of heat and love and grace that is greater than ourselves. When we have life in Christ, we have the light of his grace, and it's like the sunshine of God's rays is coming down on us so that rather than getting cold, bitter, and numb, we are becoming more awakened to the love and the grace and the transforming power of our Savior. The light of God's grace. Scripture talks about darkness as a power, the power of sin that can lead us down the wrong road. Scripture also talks about the transforming power and heat of God's grace. Maybe it doesn't say heat exactly like that, but you get my drift. And so what is shaping you? What's forming you? This week, we saw a huge contrast between the cold, dark evil of this world and the, the warm, loving grace of God. And this is a very hard-hitting illustration, but it's something that really touched me this week. Uh, about a week ago, there was a police officer named Richard Houston who was killed while on, uh, while killed while in the line of duty. And recently, they, just a few days ago, they had his funeral, and his daughter Shelby, his 18-year-old daughter, spoke at his funeral. And I can't imagine what Richard's family must feel to have your loved one just taken senselessly, without, without cause. Um, and again, he leaves behind not only his wife and his 18-year-old daughter, but two other children as well. And while Shelby felt anger and sadness and grief and confusion um, over her father's death, 
And um, she said that she wishes she could despise the man who killed her father, but she can't get her heart to hate him. And I want to say, this is what the impact is when you allow the rays of God's grace to shine on you, rather than just allowing yourself to get picked apart by the ice picks of this world. Listen to what she says about her father's killer. She said, all I can do is find myself hoping and praying for this man to truly know Jesus. I thought this might change if the man continued to live, but when I heard the news that he was in stable condition, part of me was relieved. My prayer is that someday down the road, I get to spend some time with the man who shot my father. Not to scream at him, not to yell at him, not to scold him, but to simply to tell him about Jesus. You can't say that if you've only been influenced by the ice picks of this world. You can only say that when you've subjected yourself and immersed yourself in the warm rays of God's grace that have formed your heart, that have held you close, that have reminded you that there is a good God above and beyond this cold, dark, weary, broken world. There is a God of love who is not finished bringing about his plan of redemption on this earth. The Apostle Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, For Jesus has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. <coughs> For all of us, we're either in this dominion of darkness, growing colder, more and more enslaved to the passions and desires and sins of this world, or we are being rescued and delivered from that, leaving that behind, and God's grace is leading us into the kingdom of Jesus the Son where our hearts are being remade and reformed to think and love and feel and serve like Jesus. Shelby knows that her father's killer can be rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into a new kingdom of mercy, forgiveness, and light. First John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 says this, and this is just to challenge us as we think about subjecting ourselves to God's grace and being formed by the power of Christ. First John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 says this, Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. And so one of the challenges for us, I love how Cherokee challenged the children, one of the challenges for us is to not hate or be bitter towards anyone, and, but to love and to pray for those who hurt us so that we can leave our wounds at the cross and be placed and, be, and have our wounds replaced with God's healing. See, a relationship takes two people, and you may not be able to heal a relationship, but when you come before the Lord, the Father of heavenly lights, when you come before Jesus, he can heal your heart. So you may not be able to heal a relationship, but God can heal your heart. And we can live out that scripture that as far as it depends on you, try to live at peace with everyone. We have the light of truth. We have the light of grace. And when we come to have light through Jesus, finally we have the light of eternity. So often we talk about eternal life. I want to say that eternal life is not just light that never ends. See, if you talk to someone on this world who has only known violence and misery and pain and despair, and you start talking about eternal life, that starts sounding a lot more like hell than heaven. But when we look to the scriptures and we see eternal life, we're talking about life that is in the eternal God. And so we're not just talking about a quantity or duration of life, we're talking about a beautiful quality of life. And when we have eternal life in the Lord, we're not just talking about a life that never ends. We're talking about a quality of life where the life of Jesus so fills and permeates our lives that we have the life of Jesus flowing in us. We have a relationship with Christ that will never, ever, ever end. And so it's not just about the quantity, but it's about the quality of life where Jesus takes up residence in us and we have his love flowing through us. The life of Jesus enters our lives and fills us with all the fruit of the Spirit that we read about in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
That kind of life fills our lives to the uttermost. And we're given this unwavering confidence as we have eternal life that all will be made right. That we can go through this world knowing whatever comes my way, Jesus is on the throne. This week I was praying for someone that was really going through a difficult time, still is going through a difficult time. And I said, I prayed, Lord, what can I send to this person? What can I say to this person to be an encouragement to them? And immediately the Lord brought the lyrics from the song in Christ alone to my mind. And so I typed these in and I sent these words as a text to this person. But these are the words of encouragement that the Lord brought to my mind that then I passed on to this other person. And listen to these, and, and I pray that your heart resonates with these words. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. That's a song that speaks about this unwavering faith that we can have in Christ, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. And, and I wonder, if you have this eternal life, do you have this sense that Jesus commands your destiny? See, when you know that Jesus commands your destiny, it doesn't mean you won't go through difficult, excruciating circumstances. But there's a difference between not having any sense of this and knowing Jesus is at the helm. He commands my destiny. Till he returns or calls me home, he's in charge. My life is in his hands. Nothing can pluck me from his hand. When we have life in Christ, we know that we are in his strong and mighty grip. No matter what people say about you, no matter what comes your way, no matter what happens, you are in the strong and mighty grip of Jesus, and he commands your destiny. That is a quality of life that I'm thankful that I have, not because of anything special in myself, but just because of how good our Lord and Savior is. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Again, not physical life, spiritual life. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So as we close in prayer, I'm just wondering, do you have this kind of life filling you, radiating from you this morning? I'm not just asking, are you forgiven? Are you going to heaven? That's really important. We want to know that that is secure as we trust in Jesus and ask him to forgive us. But I'm asking something that's more, uh, that, that, that's deeper and more applicable to the right here and right now. And, and that's if you are filled, not just with the knowledge that you're going to heaven, but if you're filled with the power of heaven, filling your heart and life. When we have life in Christ, our light shines. And we are filled with the light of truth, and the light of grace, and the light of eternity. And as we have that light, we're able to make good on that Cherokee challenge to go and then be a light in the life of someone else. And that is my prayer as well, that we would go and that we would let our light shine. And that's not so much going to happen by preaching or by telling other people about Jesus, although that's exactly what we want to do. But I think first and foremost that's just going to happen as we allow this eternal, spiritual life of Jesus to so fill us and permeate us and radiate from us that they sense there's something different about us. Because we're not one of the ones in this world speaking words of hurt and guilt and shame and picking at it with an ice pick. But when they're with us, the Jesus in us is so strong that they're getting some of that warmth. That warmth of his grace, the warmth of his love that is slowly shaping our heart to become more like his. And then that's having an impact on others so they too can be affected by the rays of Jesus the Son. Is that life filling you today? That's something that we receive. What does John say? These things are written that you might believe in Jesus, the Son of God, and by believing in him, have life in his name. When we believe, it's not just mental assent. Yep, I believe it. That's what my mind says. But it's about a daily trusting in the Lord our God. It's like the difference between thinking a chair will hold us up and sitting down in that chair. It's about the difference between walking, believing that... It's about the difference between believing that Jesus could light my path and taking steps of faith each day knowing Jesus is light in our path. It's putting into practice, putting into trust 
what we know and believe about him. And it's just a matter of humbly submitting ourselves to the Lord each day, saying, Lord, I trust in you. Help me to walk by faith. Fill my heart with your life. It's something for us to receive and believe in and trust in daily. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are the way and the truth and the life. You are the way through which we, be, we know the Father in heaven. And God, I pray that we would believe in you today and have life. Forgive us for those times when we've looked to other authorities, we've looked to other means to find life. Jesus, we know that there is only spiritual, eternal, everlasting life through you. And Lord, I pray for anyone here who's had their hearts burdened and broken by the cold, dark pain of this world. And Jesus, even now, would they experience the warmth of your grace, melting their hearts of stone, giving them a heart of flesh, filling them with your love and mercy and hope. Jesus, I pray for anyone here who needs your healing, that they would simply open their heart to receive the warmth of your grace, that they would confess their sin and just invite you to forgive them and set them free. Jesus, I pray that we would be so filled with your life that, that our lives would be different and people would desire the Jesus who is in us. Lord, continue to speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you are on the throne. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for coming to worship this morning. If you have questions about what it means to have this life in Christ, if you're wondering more about what it means to live with the light of truth or the light of grace, the light of eternity, um, I'd love to talk with you more about that. So please see me after church or get in touch with me during the week. Uh, I'm excited. Chicken and pork roast are waiting for us downstairs. Everyone's invited. Uh, maybe you weren't expecting it. You can still head down just receive it as a gift. Um, or at least come down for a cup of coffee. But um, thanks so much for coming to worship this morning. But one more Sunday at Advent. You believe it. And then we have Christmas Eve on the 24th at 8 o'clock. So uh, invite someone who needs hope to come along with you. And uh, as you go from this place, ready to be the light, ready to reflect the light of Christ, may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you.